Well, thank you, everybody. Um, there are no winners and losers in conferences, but you are the best audience because you were there at the beginning and you're here at the end. <laughs> thank you very much for that. I have occasionally done the last session in a conference and looked out and there's more people on the stage than there are in the audience, not so today. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, let me read you something. What has become standard practice has largely accumulated from quick reactions to crises, glossed by a veneer of high-sounding sentiments based on a salient myth. Well, that's the conclusion of a recent report into how we deal with fragility, state fragility and development. And so I think it's good at the end of the conference to ask whether our standard practice for dealing with conflict legacies and post-conflict recovery is like that, or is it better, and is it getting better? So that's what we will be talking about in the next 72 minutes. I promised I would get you finished on time. So my name's Tim Phillips, I'm a journalist. Um, I host two podcasts that deal with these kind of subjects. They're called Vox Talks and Vox Dev Talks. I'm expecting a lot more subscribers after today. Um, I, uh, I am joined today by a, a large panel, larger than you see here. We have three people on stage here. We have uh, another three who will be speaking to you online. Um, we will all be talking, they will be talking very briefly at the beginning. Um, we will then ask some questions. I hope that you will ask some questions. This goes for anyone who's joining us online as well. Please do ask questions. It's the last session, so you cannot complain that the conference didn't deal with the thing that you wanted it to deal with if you didn't ask the question. If you do that, we will come to you and we will try and answer it. So, um, we will be looking today at uh, the institutional legacies of conflict, uh, the things that have not worked and the things that have worked and how we put those together in some kind of structure that makes sense and is coordinated. And finally, I hope at the end, we'll get to some policy suggestions about things that we can do. So who's gonna be talking about this today? Well, uh, on stage, I have with me, I'll go from this end, Elena Kalku, who is the um, Under Secretary of State for Development Policy at the uh, Finnish Foreign Ministry. Uh, we have Adnan Khan, who is the Chief Economist at the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the UK, and you might also know him for his work at the London School of Economics, and also Gilles Corbonnier uh, from the uh, ICRC. Uh, joining us uh, online, we will have uh, uh, Sukena Kane in a moment, and she will be the uh, direct she's the director of the Fragility, Conflict and Violence Program at the World Bank. We have uh, Ted Miguel uh, from uh, Berkeley, and uh, Ted, I just looked up the, uh, the time in California, so I assume Ted is going to be joining us in his pajamas. Kudos to you, Ted. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, Rabab Fatima, the chair of the United Nations Peacebuilding Commission. Uh, now, we did promise you Rabab Fatima live, unfortunately, because of an alternative commitment. She cannot join us live, but she has, however, recorded a video of the things she would have said if she was live, and we're going to uh, be playing that in a minute. It's, uh, it's a shame that she won't be here to uh, answer questions, but I am sure that uh, the other people on the panel will have some opinions on what she has to say. So if we could start off by uh, playing Ambassador Fatima's video, please. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Distinguished panelists, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Warm greetings from New York and my apologies at the outset for not being able to join you in person. I thank the organizers for inviting me to this important discussion and uh, for this opportunity to share some lessons from the Peace Building Commission's experience in supporting conflict affected countries in their efforts to build and sustain peace. Since its inception, the Commission has been providing political accompaniment and advocacy to countries affected by conflict throughout various phases of their efforts, from addressing root causes of conflicts to preventing lapse and relapse 
into violent conflict and building durable peace and sustainable development. It has engaged with a total of 23 countries and regions, the majority in Africa, but also in Latin America, Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. Throughout, throughout its uh, engagements, uh, the Commission has created a platform for all stakeholders to engage in discussions on the peace building priorities of a particular country or region and mobilize required political and financial support in their realization. The Commission created the space uh, for local actors, particularly women and youth, representing civil society organizations, academia and the private sector to pi participate in national peace building efforts. Partnership with and insights from regional and sub-regional organizations and international financial institutions have also benefited the work of the Commission. More importantly, the Commission has founded its engagements on the principle of national ownership and listened carefully to the countries that engage with it and focused on delivering the support that they need. For example, the Commission provided a platform to mobilize funding for peace building priorities in Burkina Faso or to draw attention to the transitional peace process, justice process in the Gambia and on an inclusive peace process in Colombia or to build awareness about climate change related challenges in the Sahel and the Pacific Islands or to drive mobilization of resources for a smooth UN transition in Guinea-Bissau. Distinguished delegates, since the outset of the pandemic, the Commission has raised awareness about the disproportionate and multifaceted toll of the COVID-19 pandemic on conflict affected countries. The Commission was quick to adjust its, its program of work, expand uh, demand driven and flexible engagements with affected countries and regions and call for a stronger focus on countries in armed conflict and transition situations with a view to leaving no one behind. In addition to calling for universal vaccine equity and a crisis preparedness, the Commission pushed for reinvigorated multilateralism and a shift in focus uh, from a response-oriented system to a nationally-led prevention system, including building responsive and viable institutions at the national and local levels while promoting inclusive governance through a whole-of-government approach. There has been a growing recognition of uh, PBC's uh, unique contribution to the recovery efforts of conflict-affected countries. And this is now reflected in the PBC's program of work for this year, 2022, which emphasizes on greater, greater impact and results. Uh, during a recent informal retreat uh, of the PBC, the Commission discussed what that means in different contexts and how the PBC can better deliver in the face of continuing challenges from the COVID, uh, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic to the reduction of vulnerability to climate change impacts growing humanitarian crisis and conflicts and the continued unraveling of hard-won gains in curbing poverty and closing the gender divide. Uh, the, the retreat, the PVC members discussed how to forge partnerships and seek innovative solutions in addressing the multitude of challenges that demand our collective response. Distinguished delegates, the Commission has the potential to set a global example in terms of effective multi-stakeholder engagement and multilateralism, leveraging the strength and energy of the different actors that it brings to the table. As pointed out uh, in recent PBC meetings, the year 2022 marks the halfway point to the 2030 deadline for achieving the sustainable development goals and the way forward requires tapping into and working with the best of what the different actors have to offer. From the local governments to the private sector, universities and local communities. And the PBC, I believe, is uniquely positioned to do that. Whether the Commission can remain uh, fit for purpose in the face of increasingly complex challenges to peace building will depend on its ability to ensure timely and effective responses in support of nationally owned peace building priorities. For example, 
The recent engagements of the Commission in Burundi, Liberia, and Sierra Leone were designed in a way that aligned with the respective national and regional initiatives, focusing on inclusive development or sustainable reintegration of combatants, refugees and returnees, or combating challenges generated from natural disasters and exacerbated by climate change, and thus uh, they did produce the better results. While striving to meet uh, distinguished delegates, while striving to meet national uh, peace building needs, the Commission will also continue to enhance its advisory and bridging role with respect to the General Assembly, the Security Council and the ECOSOC. And this unique mandate, in combination with its flexible working methods, have allowed the Commission to coordinate and scale up UN system-wide long-term coherent support to conflict-affected countries. And we remain committed uh, to enhance this role of the Commission. The Commission will also continue to share uh, lessons learned, identify scalable good practices and innovative solutions, and build capacities through exchanges of expertise between all relevant stakeholders. In this context, the Commission is committed to promoting South-South and triangular cooperation in addressing common challenges. There are, however, other factors beyond the Commission's control. All along, the Commission has noted with concern that adequate, predictable and sustained financing remains a critical challenge as financial flows to conflict-affected countries have come under increasing pressure, particularly with regard to official development assistance devoted to peace building. It has stressed the need to enhance financial support for countries in transition phases where UN peacekeeping and special political missions are scaling down to avoid national authorities and local communities losing their funds at a time when they assume greater responsibilities. The General Assembly had the opportunity to discuss about this during the recently held high-level meeting on peacebuilding financing. It is expected that action-oriented results will be achieved in the follow-up to the high-level meeting. On its part, the Commission will continue to make best use of its resources by enhancing coherence, expanding partnerships, and identifying creative peace building financing and non-financial contributions, such as capacity building and technical cooperation. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, one of the interesting that caused me to look up the the, the uh, budget for the peace building fund of the United Nations and the commitments through 2020 to 2024 uh, about 500 million dollars, which isn't a great deal when you think that actually that means for this year the what they have the money that uh, is available to spend is slightly less than the budget of Top Gun Maverick, and wouldn't actually buy you the fighter aircraft that they fly in that film. So. Now, moving on to our, our live participants, um, I would like to first of all go to the uh, go to the internet and remotely to Sukena Kane from uh, the World Bank, who can uh, talk to us about the FCV program. Sukena, welcome. Sorry. Thank you. Let me just unmute. Uh, very happy to to be here with you today. Thanks for this opportunity. Let me just uh, probably uh, tell you about the World Bank, which as you know, it's an organization that uh, was founded after the Second World War. Uh, but over the years for, for recovery and re reconstruction, but over the years we have been shifting our focus to development actors role to address fragility, conflict and violence through their uh, full cycle. So learning from our own experience and after extensive consultation with partners, we presented two years ago our uh, World Bank Group uh, Strategy for Fragility, Conflict and Violence, FCB, in early 2020. And this strategy, what it does is really to bring a long-term development approach to a full range of fragile situations and building on analysis and strategy in each country affected by FCV, 
where we are committed to one, preventing before a conflict happens, because as we all know, investing in prevention not only reduces the human toll of conflict, but it's also smart economics. If you refer to our pathway, John uh, report with UN, pathway to peace, on average, we saying, the report is saying that for every $1 on prevention, you can save up to 16 in terms of cost of, of conflicts. The other focus of the strategy is remaining engaged in conflicts uh, and crisis situation. So we can focus on protecting human capital of vulnerable groups and the institution uh, that are in our view key to, uh, to preserve the development uh, gains. We need to build capacity and also trust all of which uh, will be needed uh, in our view for post-conflict uh, recovery. At the stage of recovery, it's really as well essential to be aware that the challenges that led to conflict and fragility in the first place cannot be resolved by short-term or partial solution in the absence of institutions that provide people with security, justice, and jobs. So recovery and reconstruction do not necessarily take place with a formal peace agreement. And getting out of the uh, fragility trap uh, is not a linear path. It can take decades with uh, usually uh, quite a lot of setbacks. So governments need to focus on rebuilding social cohesion and on addressing the long-term drivers of violence, including grievances, so the country can get on a firm path to leave the fragility behind and not fall back into the same dynamics that led to conflict. Uh, the World Bank uh, as well supports governments at this stage uh, with a, a full array uh, of analytical tools uh, geared uh, towards uh, preventing and re a revival of, uh, of conflict. For example, we have what we call a risk and resilience assessment that look at the significant risk and shocks of different kinds and serve as a basis of our engagement uh, with, with uh, uh, relevant countries. And uh, interestingly, our risk and resilience assessment, uh, we do it in fragile countries, but as well in more and more in middle income countries. And we have as well the recovery <coughs> sorry, and peace building assessment to have a platform to help governments and their international partners to identify, prioritize, and sequence the recovery and peace building. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm going to uh, come back to uh, our panelists so that we can uh, talk about some of the challenges that there are for, well, for both of those programs and strategies in the near future. Adnan, do you want to start us off? By the way, Adnan, did you recognize the quote at the beginning? Which, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the quote at the beginning came from our... Uh, uh, yes, you wrote it. So, so uh, I, I couldn't have missed it. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but, okay, so, uh, Adnan, uh, in, in the past, what sort of flaws uh, have we had when we've tried to do big projects like this? What's gone wrong? Okay. Uh, let me first begin by thanking, uh, since I have uh, the floor, uh, Kunal, Patricia, and the organizers of this conference for coming here. Let me also start with the stopping realization that we're discussing the puzzle of peace while be literally being in the shadow of a unprovoked, unjust aggression by Russia, uh, very close to where we are sitting. But this conference is about uh, fragile states, post-conflict states. And uh, that's something that, as Tim mentioned this morning, I work on the LSE Oxford Commission on State Fragility that you also cited. Uh, before discussing what should be done, uh, it's important to discuss, and discuss what went wrong. Uh, because the global experience with the building states in fragile societies with post-conflict recovery is not that great, as we all know. And uh, based on the work of the commission, I would say like uh, we identified three big reasons um, that I would say like lie at the heart of this, uh, for lack of a better word, failure. So, so those being uh, strategies being unrealistic, uh, being too much based on best practice uh, strategies and also uh, not respecting local ownership and leadership. Let me explain. Uh, uh, unrealistic because you look into the strategy on almost every country, any country, and what we see is overloaded agendas, um, 
unachievable objectives, unattainable time frames. Um, just imagine Yemen uh, after the Arab Spring uh, National Unity Government. Um, the global community asked them to implement a 10-point comprehensive reform agenda, uh, just to give you an example, one of which was a radical reform of the civil services in two years, something that took decades, generations uh, to achieve even in developed countries. And uh, why that is so? Because commonly the standard practice has been to compare fragile societies, um, post-conflict societies, with develop the long-term vision of an OECD country, think Finland, and uh, use that to generate a list of uh, policy objectives, a long list of policy objectives, and uh, mostly imposing that or using that to set the policy agenda in that country, a uh, very widely uh, uh, ambitious agenda that is extremely hard, almost impossible to achieve in most countries given the very limited capacity that they have. Second thing, which is again uh, related to it, is um, given this widely ambitious and very long agenda, the usual practice has been to, to, to encourage copying best practice institutions from developed countries. Um, call it the curse of Denmark, but since we are sitting in fin Finland, let's call it maybe the curse of Finland. Uh, Finland is great, it's, I'm, uh, I have huge respect. Uh, the land of the happiest people on earth. But Finland didn't become Finland by being Finland. It went through a very messy process of uh, reaching where it is. Um, I was talking yesterday to Mati Petrunen, I don't know whether he's here today or not. He was telling me about the last century's um, uh, civil war in Finland. So it went through a process to be here, um, a very uh, laudable position that it is, and rightly so. But it's impossible to imagine a, a fragile country today just taking that, uh, uh, just becoming Finland in one big leap. That's what we, like, unfortunately, most of uh, international policy has, uh, has often um, um, translated into uh, becoming Finland in one big leap, and uh, that doesn't work. And we know that uh, doesn't work, and, um, um, and partly that is uh, because of the, uh, of the third reason, which is um, uh, the, who is responsible, ultimately accountable for achieving this. And ultimately it has the only actor that is responsible is, is call it the local leaders, the local owners, who only people, citizens and leaders in, the, in a fragile society, in a post-conflict society, can lift their society out of the fragility trap. Others can help, international society, international actors can help, uh, or at least not stand in the way. Um, but uh, the ultimate accountability that they have is to their own citizens and uh, not to other actors. And um, that is a principle if, that, if not respected, uh, will not lead to, to, to uh, post-conflict recovery. Tony was mentioning yesterday, I remember, uh, about uh, uh, using this overloaded agenda with one instrument uh, and then hoping that all good things will flow and it uh, obviously doesn't work that way. Um, so it's a, not respecting local agency but also not respecting that uh, escaping the fragility trap is, uh, is, uh, is a process, not an event. It, it's a gradual step-by-step -step process that has to be led by local leaders. And outside actors can definitely help, um, but for them to be able to help, uh, outside actors also have to respect local agency. Uh, I'll just finish on, on one last thing, which mm -hmm. is for national leaders in post-conflict societies to signal good intentions, their actions have to be manifestly free choices. And so conditionalities, even if well chosen, would undermine that principle. So any strategy for, for, um, for helping uh, fragile societies come out of that has to first acknowledge uh, where we fell short uh, in the past. So no, Let no, me stop no there. conditionality. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Shield. It's a process, not an event. You're in right at the beginning of the process, providing humanitarian assistance. You also, I would imagine, have to work, coordinate with the sort of thing that Sukena does. How can this process improve? 
Well, uh, Tim, I think in can, it can improve on many fronts because what we see uh, working, especially you know, with our major operations today in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, South Sudan, the Sahel, Somalia, uh, it's uh, in terms of nexus, uh, it, either it doesn't work or it works too little and too late. And uh, one uh, of the reasons is that we don't have to wait for an elusive piece to <coughs> consolidate before investing in recovery. And uh, we see that uh, well, many conflicts of today are protracted. Uh, they uh, resemble more you know, chronic emergencies over time. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of opportunities during these decades where generations in a row are affected to actually restore essential services, invest in critical infrastructure, and try to support also a local agency uh, and processes, uh, as uh, Nan has, has mentioned. So I, I really can say that uh, affected communities and people, they couldn't care less whether what is brought uh, in terms of support is labeled as humanitarian or, or development or something else. Uh, they, they, they actually want to go on with their life uh, and, and restore their livelihoods. And uh, I think that we are now seeing, uh, for instance, uh, my organization, the ICRC, uh, in partnership with, uh, we have Sukaina here with us, uh, with the World Bank, with the Agence Française de Développement, how we can work together. And I was really intrigued by your, your, your final uh, uh, consideration about conditionality. Mm. And I will just say a word about Afghanistan. Uh, you know, it took us four months to be able to pay again or to deliver salaries to over 10,000 uh, health workers working in the 33 hospitals we are supporting. So it means that midwives, doctors, uh, and nurses were not paid from mid-August to mid-end November. Uh, most of them generously kept working, but had uh, really problems surviving and, and had supporting their families. And of course, humanitarian assistance is unconditional. And we see that uh, we have today many, would you say post-conflict, but let's say protracted or fragile contexts that are actually jurisdiction under sanctions. And we also face, in terms of bringing humanitarian assistance there, a number of constraints related to counter-terrorism uh, legislation and measures. And I think carving out the proper exemptions for humanitarian action is absolutely key. It's, uh, it's key first to be able to bring the, the relief and, and the assistance we must bring, but then how do we support entire systems? Like at present, we are supporting uh, up to seven uh, water utilities and sanitation systems in, in Syria, which are on the brink of collapse. And uh, to bring a water pump in this context is really difficult in terms of getting all the necessary authorization. And uh, I think that those who pay the, 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 the high price are the millions of displaced and vulnerable people on the ground. So I think we have to reflect about that and also to reflect a bit about the criminogenic uh, dynamics that sometimes sanctions uh, promote within uh, conflict-torn societies, which then strengthen potentially peace spoilers in, in, the, in, the, you know, in, the, in the peace consolidation process. And if I may, a final uh, consideration is about the fact that we can do a lot to prevent uh, the legacies of armed conflicts to be so huge. And uh, while well, my organization is really uh, doing all what it can to try to uh, get the parties to the conflict to respect international humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions, and it means uh, protecting and not attacking uh, civilians and civilian infrastructure trying to ensure that uh, electricity can still be provided to hospitals, that water uh, can still uh, you know, be pumped in cities so that it is distributed to, uh, at present, uh, for instance, in Ukraine, uh, across the country. And it means also uh, that we can really engage with other uh, parties to the Geneva Conventions who have also a responsibility to ensure respect 
for international humanitarian law. So I think these are part of the preventive measures that we can collectively take. Just a very, very briefly, Gilles, when you were talking about it, it would be good for, to carve out those exemptions. Is that something that you genuinely think could happen, or is that an aspiration that I would imagine everyone in this room agrees with, but once you get outside this room, politicians would say that's not going to happen? Well, it is happening. We have uh, exemptions, humanitarian exemptions, uh, that we negotiated and were adopted by the UN Security Council. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, we have also worked with the European Union and, and other <laughs> you know, uh, bodies uh, imposing uh, different sanction regimes. And it is working. The problem is that once uh, it is uh, negotiated, uh, you have uh, so-called chilling effects with banks and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, s uh, financial service providers who say, well, under the current provisions, we think that we might service you, but the profits we can make are very limited because these are very small markets, and the risks of any of these provisions be, you know, are changing over time and yeah. us being, uh, facing risks is too big so that we don't take the risk. And you have also the de-risking by suppliers who s sometimes simply refuse to, uh, to, to, to sell and, and, and provide the necessary goods and services in fragile environments because of uh, well, counter-terrorism uh, measures and legislation and sanctions. And these are constant negotiations uh, which are um, uh, extremely uh, well, burdensome, but, uh, but we do uh, negotiate, okay. and we, we do fortunately uh, reach some results for in most of the instances, but it takes months. And as I was uh, referring to in the example of Afghanistan, those who pay the price are actually the health workers who were paid before by the former uh, authorities. They are the same workers, and they are attending the same children, Afghan children and, and women, and, and because of the change of the regime, they had to go through, a, and they are still going through a period where uh, it is extremely uh, difficult. It has uh, huge humanitarian implications, and I think that we should do uh, collectively a better job, but, uh, but we, we, we do achieve results, fortunately. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Can we go uh, over to Ted now? Uh, Ted, uh, yeah. Hello, hello, Berkeley. Helsinki calling. Hello, Ted. Uh, now, some of the issues that we're discussing here, these are things that you've been tracking for a long time in your research, aren't they? Yeah, good morning. Uh, it's, it's great to, I guess, good evening over there. Great to, to chat with you all. I wish I could be there uh, in person. Um, it's been really uh, stimulating to hear the, the, the points that are made. Uh, what uh, I've been uh, fortunate to, to work on is really trying to, to build some uh, evidence base and work with colleagues to build evidence on a number of these issues. Um, the the co conflict space, the humanitarian space is an area where Traditionally, there's actually been um, so much urgent need that sometimes uh, it's been difficult to collect data. It's been difficult to carry out the kind of thoughtful research that we need to inform policy. And so uh, for a number of uh, key issues, the, the evidence base is often, has often been limited. Um, that's starting to change now. And I think from a research perspective, uh, there have been such important gains over the last decade or so uh, in understanding a lot of the issues that have been the subject of this, uh, this conference. And I think, you know, the, the research output that's been presented really, really illustrates, uh, you know, how much, how much progress we've made. Uh, I want to just talk about two particular points where uh, the evidence base has really emerged. And I think these are issues that speak directly to uh, issues of protracted conflicts, uh, the, the key legacies of conflict that, that have been the subject of the, the, the conversation. The first uh, piece of uh, evidence or evidence base that I want to uh, emphasize really is the, the growing uh, and at this point well-established literature linking extreme climate to armed conflict. So there's been a lot of discussion around how there are many protracted conflicts, how difficult it is to uh, you know, uh, build up the state and, and avoid future conflict. Well, in the coming decades, as the world warms and as there's more and more extreme um, weather, it's going to become even more challenging. The winds will really be blowing against us in some settings uh, due to climate change. So let me just briefly summarize that, that evidence. There's a, a growing body of over 100 quantitative statistical analytical studies at this point. 
uh, with, with some of my co-authors, we've assembled meta-analysis, trying to combine all the, the, these studies and come up with some, some central conclusions from this explosion of research, quantitative research on the link between extreme climate and, and violence. And the main finding is there's just a very strong, robust statistical relationship. And I think everybody now in the conference is, is, is increasingly familiar with these patterns and how important the issue of climate change is going to be in the, in the coming decades. But uh, the, the kind of uh, you know, main estimates are unless changes are made uh, in the coming decades, there could be an increased risk of civil conflict uh, in vulnerable states of 30 to 40 percent due to global warming alone just as a kind of base estimate from, from the research that's been done. So it's just a, a fact that I want to put out there. And, you know, again, as we talk about getting out of conflict and ha helping societies emerge from armed conflict, uh, we have to take into account this kind of economic shock, which is going to make the situation that much more uh, challenging going forward. I know colleagues at the World Bank have been very involved in this research, and I was very interested to hear the col uh, colleague uh, Sukena Keynes uh, remarks on this earlier. So that's one uh, you know, body of evidence. The second body of evidence I want to just briefly mention and put out there because uh, I, I think it, it merits discussion uh, really is the body of evidence about how best to achieve better life outcomes and social integration for refugees and other displaced people. Again, in humanitarian situations, it's often been extremely challenging to collect the kind of data that we need uh, to best understand what policies are most effective, which approaches are most effective. There's obviously so much urgency around those situations. And until recently, there was almost no uh, high quality, publicly available longitudinal data on refugees to allow us to track their life trajectories and understand uh, how to improve, improve their lives. That has changed again in recent years. There's been a real shift uh, with, with extremely valuable partnerships between the World Bank, UNHCR with the Joint Data Center, with humanitarian organizations um, to collect this kind of data. And there, is, uh, there has been an emerging body of evidence speaking to some of the key policies that could improve lives for refugees and, and other displaced uh, peoples. And as, as we know, there's just so many tens of millions of people in that situation today. So I just want to mention one finding from uh, new data there. There's always a lot of controversy in hosting countries about uh, the impact that refugees will have on the host nation. And of course, we know that most refugees remain refugees for many years, if not decades. So this is not just a temporary issue. Most societies that are hosting refugees will have to find a way forward uh, between host communities and refugee communities. At the same time, the political economy is often challenging. And there's a lot of you know, resistance, opposition, negative feelings towards, towards refugee uh, communities in many societies. But there has been some exciting research uh, indicating what policies can promote uh, successful economic integration. I just want to point to research by colleagues, uh, some of whom are at the World Bank, a, a co-author of mine, uh, Dr. Sandra Rosso and, and her colleagues have studied the issue of the integration of Venezuelan refugees in uh, Colombia. Now, obviously the Venezuela situation isn't exactly uh, you know, central to the discussion here in the sense that there hasn't been a civil war in Venezuela, but there's certainly been a lot of political violence, instability, economic collapse, and millions of Venezuelans have sought refuge in, uh, in Colombia. So Dr. Rosso and colleagues have studied a policy change in Colombia using high quality data, really good evidence, a policy change in Colombia that provided greater uh, labor market access for refugees and tried to understand the effect of that, not just on the refugees, but also on earnings and wages for the host community. And they actually found largely positive effects, providing greater labor market access and permits for refugees, not only improved their income, it had no measurable harm on the host community economically. So I think this is, you know, again, just coming from the research perspective, a very exciting moment for us as we study post-conflict situations, because the evidence base is growing, uh, and we actually have some findings that those of us who are researchers, those of us who are those those on the stage who are policymakers, can really take to host governments um, to give them a way forward uh, in terms of productive ways of integrating refugees into the host community. So I just want to stop there with those two. Uh, examples of how research
can be really important in informing the choices here. Uh, but again, also how the, the evidence base continues to grow and we need to really learn a lot more uh, to craft the most effective policy. So I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Thanks, thanks very much, Ted. And Lena, I'll, I'll come to you now. The, what I will do after this, my plan is to go back to Sukena because I'm sure that she'll have some reactions to some of the points that have been raised. Then after that, I'll throw it over to you. And so get ready with your questions. If you are, while Sukena's talking, sort of put your hand up and we'll get the microphones ready. But Alina, first of all, for you, from what you hear, what is it that you want and how close are you to getting it? Well, a very relevant question. And first of all, thank you, Wider, for tackling an issue that is maybe one of the most difficult and complicated challenges that the diplomatic community, uh, the development community, the security community, the research community face, actually, and, and try, to, try to solve. And I think the sad story is that we have also countries that have been middle-income countries uh, that have been developing well, and then history turns backwards, and actually we see lots of fragility emerging. And, and that's also a point, uh, I think, where we can learn a lot from uh, how things should improve uh, observing the countries that go actually backwards. A few observations. Um, and I, I think uh, Johanna, the State Secretary, explained lots of things that Finland is trying to do uh, on, um, on uh, promoting, uh, when promoting peace and, and peace settlements and, and uh, post-conflict situation, uh, building stable societies after that. A few observations indeed. Um, uh, one issue we try to tackle when we look at what a peace settlement means, uh, you need to have the high level agreements among parties, first of all, but you also need to have uh, agreement within the society. Uh, within local communities and among and between local communities. So we try to um, focus on uh, sustainability of both uh, levels, uh, not leaving anyone behind when uh, trying to promote an agreement among uh, the sort of high level uh, uh, decision makers among parties and also building um, um, lots of uh, confidence uh, through national dialogues, uh, supporting number of actually national dialogue processes um, uh, among local uh, communities. Um, otherwise, you leave the seeds of violence in the society, uh, either on the top level, as we've seen, for instance, in Afghanistan back uh, in 2002, um, or you leave seeds of violence uh, within the communities um, on local level uh, sometimes. Uh, there's lots of uh, experienced economists here, and uh, I, I understand you've been looking at the economic side of, of post-conflict situations. Um, I think we've tried to look at um, how people earn their living post-conflict uh, times, um, and one of the issues is how they spend their time also after the conflict. Um, this is, uh, I think, a key issue indeed. Um, there's lots of criminal employment. Uh, fighting has turned into a profession in a number of uh, conflict areas. There's lots of trafficking weapons, uh, drugs, uh, even people, uh, humans. Um, and people make a living out of having a conflict. Uh, I think this is, this is a number one issue to be solved. Show people that there are other things to do. Um, look at uh, Sahel and the, and the, the broad zone uh, up to Horn, Horn of Africa. Uh, I think if we don't find uh, livelihoods and jobs for people, uh, there's not going to be a, a sustainable peace. Uh, then political stability. Uh, Finland's uh, history has been referred to, and, uh, and indeed, a um, uh, little over 100 years ago, we were a failed state. And now, for I believe seven years back to back, we have been uh, the least failed state 
uh, in, in, the, in an international index. They've changed the name. I think it's a fragility index these days. It used to be a failed state index before. Um, I think um, on, 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 on the political level, uh, what happened early on after uh, an internal war was that we had to uh, have a society where people can form different political parties, um, we learned a uh, hard way how to uh, form coalition governments, actually. We don't have a two-party system. This is a country of, of, with large number of, of political parties. Um, forming coalition governments uh, was a tough uh, learning curve. Uh, they were short-lived in the beginning. Uh, but in the end, it, it became uh, sort of part of the culture, the, the political cult culture in, in this country, and created a lot of stability. Also, local democracy. Uh, there's this uh, wonderful um, uh, UN World Bank report, Pathways to Peace, which um, indicates how important local and regional democracy can be, um, where people can actually address their grievances together with others. The most stable countries in the world are, are those that have an active, uh, thriving local democracy or, or regional democracy. Um, so I think, I think that's, um, that's worth uh, pursuing. Um, people in, 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 in all countries seem to want very similar things. You, you always uh, hear the argument that you shouldn't export democracy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if this is my 14th year in diplomacy, uh, if I talk to people, different continents, different countries, um, um, everybody wants to have education, everybody wants to have a job, uh, family and friends, and a say in, in issues that are important for them. Uh, we've had fragile countries um, where people have voted uh, taking a personal risk for their, for their security. Um, so I think, uh, I think democratic uh, uh, open society is, is worth, worth pursuing. Um, there's lots of discussion on institutions. I'm sure you've been discussing this at, at length and the relationship between uh, the state and, and the society. This is about capacity. This is about human rights, rule of law. Uh, this is about security, this is about uh, government budget management, um, how to manage um, revenues, how to manage uh, donor contributions, um, service delivery, hugely important, employment, jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, legitimacy of the government and, and uh, sometimes regional governments, uh, accountability very important indeed, and if, if there's no accountability, if there's no legitimacy, I think the confidence will, uh, will get eroded and, and you easily drift back to, to conflict. Um, gender was mentioned, young people were mentioned. Um, uh, I think um, people need to see that the government is on their side. Uh, there's, there's a government worth being loyal to uh, and, and the government uh, with which you want to work to, to, to improve uh, the, your, your living. And then, of course, um, I think it was President Ahtisari who said always, peace is a matter of will. Um, also, uh, a stable, developing society is a matter of will. You need to have political leadership that actually wants uh, to develop the country, wants, have a good, uh, wants to have a good society and a peaceful society. Um, we all can help, but if, if, if there's not this uh, will there, if there's no political will uh, to solve the problems, it is very hard to, to do it from, from, from the outside. Um, homegrown solutions uh, have, have been mentioned, mentioned here. And um, I, think, I think there's one danger uh, very clearly seen there's a competition of values and political systems going on globally. Um, authoritarian uh, governance. Uh, there's, there's many leaders uh, that, that have a temptation to, to, to imitate uh, authoritarian governance, which means you don't share power. 
uh, you don't accept the fact that governments change, um, like in a coalition uh, government system in, in this country. Every party would know they are either in the government or they're out, uh, but they have to be able to cooperate with each other over time uh, in, a, in a coalition government. If they want to get in, they have to uh, make compromises. They have to, to agree and, and share power with, with others. Um, a final point, um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on nexus, triple nexus, international coordination, um, and, and uh, of course, um, uh, lots of, um, uh, lots of um, uh, whole uh, government approach also. Um, uh, once, as, as a young diplomat, tens of years ago, I, I, I thought there'd be an agency that would serve uh, if, as a country in a fragile situation and come and say that I'm your um, state building service. I'm going to help you to, to take into account all the aspects and, and, and help in state building, but there's no such institutions. There's a number of remarkable agencies and institutions like, like the World Bank, like the United Nations, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, ICRC, there's lots of important, much larger donor countries than Finland. Um, I think, um, I think uh, Nexus is, 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 is one of the most Im important inventions. Uh, we, have to have, we have to have a common analysis on the situations we have to plan a strategy together. We should be able to um, um, have a, a very concrete plan on, on, on what to do uh, together with the government in question or the parties in question and, and ourselves. And then everybody would do their share uh, so that the sum would be larger than, than, than the bits and pieces. We have lots of patchwork. Uh, still ongoing, even if, the, uh, if, if coordination has, has, has really important, uh, importantly improved over, over time. Um, there was a reference already uh, to, to, to not doing everything at once um, at the same time. I, th I think the problem is when, when we look back in, in our history that we actually did lots of things um, at the same time into the right direction. Uh, it took a long time. Uh, there, there was no leapfrogging often um, happening, but lots of things have to move towards a right direction at the same time. And, and I think this is the most difficult part of, of, of everything um, uh, when, when, when you develop uh, your country uh, and, and start from a fragile situation. Um, this is, this is, I think this is the major challenge, and you have to accept that you have to prioritize. Not everything will happen, uh, happen uh, in, in a fortnight. And there we need lots of strategic patience. Um, generation, we, we're talking about generational changes here. Um, uh, you might run out of time like, like, like it happened in, in Afghanistan. It would have taken a generation, two generations to change a country from the situation where, where it was 2001. Um, and, and one more uh, thing to add, proxy wars. Um, if there's too many proxies waging a war on, on, a, on a territory of a country, uh, you can forget uh, finding a solution. Uh, and I don't have an answer to this, but, but we know a conflict can uh, be prolonged simply because there's others who fight on your territory. Uh, their wars, um, and, and we, we have lots of examples uh, in, in the decades uh, behind us, and hopefully not that many in, in front of us on, on how proxies can actually destroy a good process. And this needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, thank you very much for that. I really want to get to Kena's uh, reaction to all of this, because we, uh, we've given sort of quite a shopping list of things that we, we might, that, that we might like her to do. Plus said, 
don't try and do everything at once. So if we can go back to uh, Sukaina. Yeah, what's your reaction to some of the things that we've, we've heard here? Because you have to provide jobs, work on organized crime, you have to work, uh, you have to work with uh, the sort of thing that Gilles is doing and facilitate that. You have to coordinate. Uh, maybe you have to become a, a state building agency. Is that the job that you'd like? We need your sound, Sukain. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Sorry That's about all right. That. All right. Can you, you can hear me well now. Right? Yes, yes. So the first thing I, I would like to, to say here is that very pleased to hear all the, those different perspectives that I really believe are aligned with what we're trying to do as a World Bank. So the first thing to, to do, in, in, in my view, is really to learn from the lessons of of our engagement, engagement of partners in FCV settings. And the, something that seems obvious, but I, I still would like to stay here, is that there's no one size fits all approach uh, in, uh, that, that would work. Uh, each conflict situation is shaped by a different set of root causes. You know, and that's why our analytical work is extremely important, as Ted has mentioned, because local conflicts could be around land, water, extractive industries. Uh, of subnational in some areas because they don't have access to resources and including as well issues of uh, accountability, corruption, cross-border conflicts when you think about the Sahel for instance, or, and of course like Ted mentioned, climate change and of course as we are all learning the pandemics. That's why really uh, uh, understanding uh, the, 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 the situation and the, how, by, by a strong analytical work. The second is that, in my view, exiting fragility requires partnership. So that's why it's not about the World Bank. The World Bank alone cannot, cannot do it. We require really an alliance at different levels. One, if you look at the country level, and I think it's Adnan that said it, it requires strong national leadership. The, the leadership, the country has, be, has to be on the driver's seat. We're here to support, but we cannot uh, uh, do or uh, impose or expose support, peace, and development. And it's important that you have a population that is mobilized against uh, uh, the fragile system that led to conflict. And uh, we need as well as we realize the backing from at least part of the private sector and civil society. So within the country, it's, it's important to, to, to have that coalition. Uh, the second is at uh, the international community level, recovery requires that all of us humanitarian, development, peace and security actors and the private sector to understand and contribute uh, to our areas of comparative ad advantage. For the World Bank, it means that we, we are integrating long-term consideration towards sustained development and we work with humanitarian as, 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 as it was mentioned by um, uh, ICRC. Before our strategy, uh, FCV strategy, we used to think that when you have an active conflict, we need really to leave the, the stage, let the humanitarian uh, uh, deal with the conflict and come back later. We realize that this doesn't work, right? Because not only we lose a uh, hard, uh, hard, hard, hard uh, one uh, development gain, but as well our re-engagement becomes more difficult and becomes more complicated for the, for the country. So now, as it was mentioned, we work uh, with, uh, with uh, humanitarian partners and security. Let me provide two examples here. In the Philippines, we have, for instance, as, uh, assisting through what we call um, a multi-donor trust fund uh, in the areas of Mindanao after the peace deal uh, signed in 2012. And our support is really focusing on service delivery infrastructure, skills development, and more participatory uh, uh, processes in, in an area that almost doubled the national average on, on poverty. And that's what we're seeing in middle income countries that we have those pockets of subnational conflicts, of national fragility that we, 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 it's important uh, that we address as an institution if you want to reach our target of eliminating extreme, extreme poverty. Another um, example of partnership with, uh, with the uh, UN is uh, that uh, thanks to our partnership with UN and ICRC, we've been able to deliver critical services in, um, uh, for, to vulnerable uh, populations in areas that are inaccessible to us, you know, such as South Sudan, 
uh, beyond Juba, right? Because humanitarian and UN uh, have usually deeper field uh, presence. So for instance, in recently in South Sudan, we are financing the second phase of the, uh, with ICRC of South Sudan provision of essential uh, health services uh, with ICRC, as I said, UNICEF, WHO. And uh, the other examples uh, uh, mentioning Adva uh, as Afghanistan was, was mentioned is uh, through our, um, uh, the multi-donor trust fund and with our uh, board approval to uh, work with UN agencies and international NGOs to deliver basic services. But that being said, I would like as well to, to, to make, uh, to, to end with two, two issues here. One is about the democracy and how it's important. We, I think we all agree with that, but my own experience uh, from the bank and having been for four years, uh, uh, country director for Mali, Niger, Chad and Burkina, I think democracy means uh, different things for different people. And what we're seeing is if democracy, we understanding only as holding elections, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily uh, yield to dividend, as I call it, the, 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 demo, the dividend of the democracy. For people, it won't, it, won't, it won't resonate. I can give the example of Burkina Faso. They had election, nobody disputed uh, the fairness or little dispute at least of the fairness of the election, but yet because the basic service of security to people was not was not uh, a service by the government, it ended up by having a, a, a political transition and a coup that you know people uh, at, at the end welcome uh, for, for uh, uh, because they felt that something different than the election needed to happen to make a change uh, happen in in, in their lives. So. I think democracy is important, but it's democracy not for the sake of ticking the box of having election, but democracy for the sake of providing dividends to, 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 to the people. What, what's it, what, what, what would they gain in terms of accountability and in terms of, of, of democracy? So that, that is extreme. And then to the point uh, made by Ted on forced displacement, this is an extremely relevant agenda. I think, as someone was saying, Europe is now realizing that, you know, forced displacement is not something that people choose to, and it's it's a it's a very complicated matter to address, and that's why we're working very closely with the UNHCR. Uh, it's part of our either 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 uh, window to uh, be more deliberate about addressing the needs not only of the refugees, but as well of the, of, of the host communities. Let me pause here and uh, happy to uh, further elaborate. Thank you. Thanks very much, because we need to ask the rest of you what you think. So if anyone has a question, then stick your hand up and the microphones are coming now. And we have a first question just down here. Keep your hands up if you want to ask a question as well, and then we can sort of get to you, have a rapid turnover. Thank you very much, Andrea Ruggeri, University of Oxford. I'm going to put on the table a puzzle of peace. We have systematic evidence that the UN peace operations are effective, they protect civilians, and they stop belligerents. However, uh, CIPRI says that according to their data, we have reached the highest level of uh, military expenditure in 21, $2,000 billion. And uh, this has been increasing in the past seventh year. And uh, countries such as the US, Russia, UK are those that are spending a lot of money. But the budget of UN peacekeeping is only 6.3 billion, whereas Norway, even Norway, spends more in military expenditure, seven. Uh, Russia, 10 times more than the UN peacekeeping. US 100 times more. So we have evidence that the UN peacekeeping works. We know that we can save lives, but it seems that the trend is to spend more in military expenditure rather than peace operation. So is there a puzzle of peace or a puzzle for peace? Probably not that complicated a puzzle, isn't it? Adnan, what do you think about that? <laughs> uh, as far as the UK is concerned, I, I don't think we, we are uh, playing our part uh, both on this uh, and being one of the largest players on, on development. 
and uh, working not just on peacekeeping, uh, contributing to that, but also in terms of the addressing the fundamental drivers of conflict. So we just released our new international development strategy, uh, which basically addresses those issues that I was talking about. Like it talks about like narrowing of the agenda, uh, just four big priorities, not hundred. It talks about like uh, patient long-term development, so not like immediate, um, um, call it like um, uh, immediate successes. It talks about working with government, not around governments, so like in the sense of like working with policy actors uh, and respecting local leadership. And uh, in terms of peacekeeping, yes, uh, UK is one of the largest, um, um, largest uh, bilateral, but also multilateral donor in the world. Um, and uh, I think the larger point is um, keep international peacekeeping is certainly needed. In certain situations, it can be, um, it can matter quite a lot. Uh, especially in situations where some period of temporary security is, is needed. Um, most of the experience suggests that pe international peacekeepers also become very unpopular after roughly say like, I don't know, like seven to 10 years. So that period is to be used in terms of creative, like uh, in terms of attempts at state building. And that's where um, um, I think lies the biggest challenge in terms of like helping societies come out of the fragility during that period where we have a window of opportunity, what we call a pivotal moment, uh, using that creatively, using that uh, not to, to like waste that opportunity on, um, on, um, on an overloaded agenda, but to achieve things which are, uh, which are feasible given the limited capacity of those countries which are also feasible given the politically pertinent time frame, uh, and which if achieved can help the society achieve maybe modestly, maybe step by step, uh, one step out of poverty. So as Tim mentioned in the beginning, in the morning, like in Tunisia, in the post-Arab uh, Spring government, they focused on, at least at that time, uh, cleaning the mosque like, uh, as one step that was visible that would improve the, uh, which would clearly signal as something which, um, uh, which they are doing to improve the lives of the people. So in all equivalents, like we have to find the equivalents of, the, of cleaning the mosque, using that opportunity that is provided by peacekeeping in environments where uh, some temporary phase of security or like international uh, security is needed. And there are many situations like that, I agree. Uh, Elena, can I ask you, um, what's the, at the moment there is a, 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 a debate between defense spending and financing peacekeeping going on, and it's probably different outside this hall than it is inside, isn't it? Yes, uh, I think we're not living in an ideal world. If we lived mm. in an ideal, wor ideal world, uh, we would have very little military spending uh, altogether. Um, we do have this discussion uh, in, in Finland when it comes not, not that much about uh, our domestic military spending and uh, spending on peacekeeping or crisis management, but rather uh, on military spending and development spending. Um, although uh, so far um, it has gone quite well from development point of view, we haven't cut anything from development, we're still trying to, to get a little bit uh, more for, for development spending. Um, I think uh, if, if you'd ask uh, normal people, they would say that we have to take care of ourselves to be able to support others. And uh, I, think, I think this is also an important argument. Um, Peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping and uh, military crisis management has grown impressively in the past decades. So we really have to, um, have to admit that uh, it has become an important activity. Um, for instance, in Africa, there's, there's uh, lots of local capacity at the moment. Um, and, um, and as long as there's a demand for this kind of uh, services, uh, there's also, um, also hopefully uh, countries in Africa, in Europe, elsewhere, who, who help others uh, with, with peacekeeping. And uh, I hope the spending will remain at a respectable level. We'll have to wait and see. Tony, you've got a question. So, um, Tony Addison from Copenhagen University. Um, there are clearly a lot of people making a lot of money 
out of conflict and human misery mm -hmm. in all its forms, including uh, the descent into conflict as, as states are captured and then degenerate and then maybe ultimately go into violence. So the, the question for the panel is, this is clearly something we can do about, something about, about the, um, the financial system, about the public relations companies who uh, champion dictators, uh, about the lawyers who facilitate um, hiding the money, the illicit financial flows, uh, and so forth. Um, so uh, shouldn't we do something about this? What do we do about it? Because intervening in societies in Africa, in Asia, that you know, are not our own societies as Europeans, that's a difficult challenge. We, we don't know the, the, the complexity of the political forces there. But we can do something about Western banks and Western lawyers and Western public relations companies and so forth. So, so what do we do about the money men or the money women? What do we do, Gilles? <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> it's, it's interesting, uh, your question, really, because humanitarians, they look at one aspect of uh, world economies, which is survival economies. How do people survive despite the armed conflict? And how can we, as humanitarians, just support uh, their survival strategies? But of course, you have in war economies what you describe. You have uh, how do different parties to the conflict finance their war efforts, and uh, how much, you know, criminal activities is ongoing under impunity, and, and, and then what are the, the winners and losers, if you wish. And I think it's important to understand the interrelations between the different, uh, you know, aspects or dimension of war economies as well is the interactions between the micro level and the more macro level. Uh, so I think researchers have still uh, a lot to contribute in, in this understanding. And, but what I want to say, I was referring before to uh, the question of, uh, of uh, sanctions. I think it's quite interesting to see, for instance, that <clears throat> uh, when we had uh, the, the, the NASDAQ crashing uh, with the dot-com bubble, uh, very quickly, armed groups actually seized the revenues of quasi-public utilities in Kisangani and Goma to make up for the lost revenues from coltan. And this gave immediate rise to the lack of potable water and the risk of a cholera crisis. And so the dilemma for uh, an organization like the ICRC is to say, okay, is it our role to step in and bring uh, you know, back the the uh, water pumping station together with the chemicals re required to have uh, drinking water and avert the cholera? Or how do we then go about bringing these dots together? And uh, I think that this is a dilemma. Uh, there is no magic bullet to go about it. But what I mentioned before is that <clears throat> we have to be more sensitive, for instance, when there has been an attempt to bring uh, tech companies uh, out of buying, uh, you know, uh, uh, specific minerals that uh, might be sourced from the DRC, you had uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, informal miners out of business for a while because of the chilling effects. And we could see directly the humanitarian consequences in terms of the survival capabilities of families who were depending on that. And I'm very sympathetic to what Adnan brought in terms of, you know, the, the, the pace needed for, for transitioning. And when we do uh, <clears throat> think about transitioning while preserving or protecting the most vulnerable, it's also important to think about the crimo criminogenic dimensions of certain policies which make sense from, uh, you know, London or, or Geneva or New York or Helsinki but which actually <clears throat> might have very negative impact when we look at the micro level in, in conflict zones. If I break the rules, we have time for one more question, if anyone really wants to ask it. Then I have no need, oh yes, yes. You get the, yes, just there in the center. Last question of conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the nice discussion. So um, I want to relate the um, impact of uh, the COVID pandemic with the uh, Ukraine crisis. So given that um, these two, let's say, um, crises has um, 
led to an increase in commodity prices recently or inflation, and mostly in developed, now in developed, or let's say in both developed and developing world. So, uh, and these two crises will also lead to uh, an increase of poverty. And given that the increase of poverty is, is also linked to uh, an increase of social unrest. So my question is, um, what are measures that uh, we are planning to take to prevent this, let's say, uh, vicious cycle to happen? So an increase in poverty and social unrest due to uh, the COVID pandemic and the Ukraine-Russia crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's good for uh, Sukena. If you're, if you're still there online, did you uh, hear the question there? I did. Uh, right. um, and, and I know that we're running out of time. So just uh, uh, thank you for this excellent question. The way we're trying to, to deal with the compounding risk of crisis, including pandemic and, and, and now the, the war in Ukraine, is really to look at each country, but have a, uh, those key principles. One, protecting lives because they have you have immediate needs, whether it's because of the pandemic to protect vaccination, provide vaccination, uh, or provide food uh, for uh, in, uh, to, to areas uh, impacted by the rise of food, of, of food uh, prices. So protecting lives, protecting livelihoods, you know, income generating activities. Uh, have some in infrastructure for con countries and people to continue to have their activities. But then the third pillar is uh, protecting the future because as a development agency, we already need to, to keep a uh, 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 sight of the future, uh, not because short-term and humanitarian is not the development. Humanitarian is key for us to be uh, a development partner, but we always need to uh, have uh, all, uh, that long-term perspective and knowing that, as we was said here, that getting out of conflict is not linear. Uh, it can take decades with uh, setbacks. So our own resilience is tested. Our own ability as institution, as development partners to remain engaged to continue to protect those lives, those livelihoods and the, and, and the future. So it's about adjusting all the time our programs being adaptive, as we say, in order to respond to those to those needs. And, and now knowing that, uh, you know, compounding crisis, climate pandemics, uh, war are here, unfortunately, to stay. And it's upon us now to adjust and to be more adaptive to this, uh, to this new normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that's uh, that's really all we have time for, definitely. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to everyone on the panel. Um, we better close this. We've got some closing remarks, and then I think we're we're done for the day, aren't we? I think we've put enough into this already. So, uh, thank you very much to everyone on the panel. Uh, that was great. Thank you.